right, so in information design, our final project needs to involve a map. And while your map might not be the primary focal point of your poster, it should be included. Um, I did want to go over um, just the history and map design in general to help inform where we're coming from. Since we talked about the timeline design and different formats for that, um, it's important that I also address that for map design, even though the map isn't the primary focus of your final project. So interesting assumptions about maps um, is that they're never actually realistic representations. There's always some sort of skewing um, based on accuracy or pre precision. It's You just have to consider that, that it's a little bit relative. Um, it can't depict everything in a map, you know, even as it says, um, can depict it can't depict all physical, biological, and cultural features, even the smallest area. So it already has to have a narrative. You're already editing a map and, and deciding what is going to go where. Um, and as a result, they're just kind of estimations. Um, and you can definitely look at that when you look at the history of map making and how much it has evolved. Um, so when we talk about making maps, it is called cartography. Um, this may be a familiar term to you. Um, the oldest known maps um, were around 2300 BC, and this is an image you can kind of see um, on the right. Uh, it is, you can see that it is especially prevalent in Greece when they were looking um, at um, the, the seafaring cultures and those who had the mathematical um, prowess to actually uh, uh, measure and uh, map all these things. So you can see how it's actually sort of accurate this sample here um, you can see even bigger and then this is basically what they have explored so the whole space right now isn't the world per se it's the area they've explored um, and um, it's not in proportion you can see that there are um, a lot of different elements added to it as well that may be unfamiliar with the winds etc so it's, it's quite beautiful and to see what they decide are important features um, so during the medieval times, um, the European maps were really dominated by religious views. So as a result, uh, Jerusalem was often depicted at the center of the map, interestingly or not. So if you look um, on the right image, you can see that um, it's basically you have kind of these leaves. You have Africa, Asia, and Europe, and the center of that flower, those leaves, is Jerusalem. Uh, and so that really does change things. Um, in perspective because it's not about proportion per se, it's just uh, more about um, other cultural aspects. And um, of course at this time everything was drawn um, and illuminated, meaning illustrated by hand, um, which made the, the distribution of maps incredibly limited. So this wasn't necessarily something that obviously everybody had or even a lot of travelers didn't necessarily have it. These were something that was more for um, the elite and people in higher up in religion as reference um, as well as kind of artifact. During the Renaissance time, um, printing maps became more widely available in the 15th century. So that made a big difference um, to cost and availability. Um, you can also um, see the image on the right starting to depict um, America and new, uh, new discoveries early 16th century. Um, so these really had a big importance, but primarily the fact that the, the printing process really changed access to maps. And then modern maps. Okay, so they became more accurate and factual because scientific methods were starting to be used um, during the 17th century. So now the, the proportion is actually getting more accurate. Um, also, um, w during World War I, um, aerial photography starting to be used. Um, so until the widespread of aerial photography, it still was hard to actually measure things. So when you can actually get aerial photography, get far up in the sky, then you're able to actually get a much better sense of where things are in proportion to others. Um, also, this is when they start um, talking about GIS. So Geographic Information System. Um, in fact, we even have a program um, for that here at our school in which you're actually looking at uh, mapping systems and how that works within relationship to computers and other technologies. So when you're designing a map, 
you need to determine um, the purpose and audience. Obviously, with most designs, you always have to think about the objective of the map, what you're trying to communicate, or objective of the design, as well as who your target audience is. That way, you can decide what you're going to include in the map based on those objectives. As I said, you can't include everything. You actually have to edit it down. So you need to determine what the objective is. Um, keeping it simple, if you see a complicated map with a lot of content, it's incredibly hard to actually find what you need. Uh, and so that is really important, editing it down, keeping it simple. Um, and then a map can be narrative as well. So um, you can decide that um, one map might be, one version of the map might show um, prominent religious um, locations, one might be other cultural locations, you could talk about trade routes. It really depends on what the story is, what you're including the map with. Um, so for you, when you're talking about for the final project, um, you can decide, okay, the map is appropriate to show the location of where I'm researching, but what other things are pertinent to this story? Are there other things I'm going to talk about on this poster that I also want to um, identify on the map? That might be really helpful. You might notice that when you read certain books, like even Lord of the Rings, um, even fictional stories, they'll give you a map often so you can kind of give a sense of what you're actually looking at. It's usually on the end papers and it's fun even though it's fictional to actually understand relationship where certain um, towns or locations are so you can imagine that as you're reading the story. Um, and as with all design, you need to really think about visual hierarchy and placement and directing the eye. So effective map designs, as usual, it is always helpful to actually compare effective and ineffective designs. Um, this one is a really engaging design. They really use spot illustrations, those little small illustrations in a dynamic way. So they really, you get a sense it's playful. Um, and not just kind of empty. They decided, okay, they were just going to give the capital of the state um, and the state name. And then they're going to focus on what um, is really that area is well known for. So you see um, South Dakota has Mount Rushmore. Nebraska is pretty wide and open. So they chose to use um, a railroad, um, et cetera. And you can, without including a lot of text, you can still decipher what this content is. So maps, you don't necessarily need to include a lot of text. You can use other visual elements to still communicate. Um, this is an interesting use. So we're dealing with more informational graphics and data visualization with the use of maps. Um, and so it's still engaging. There is a clear objective to this. Um, and it has supporting graphics that enhance the comp um, comprehension. So it's not just a map. Um, it's using the, um, the bubble charts in order to really relay what it means. And then it even has the uh, bar chart in order to communicate that as well. So there's a lot of things going on. And then they still have that explanatory text. You'll notice that they needed to simplify um, the maps quite a bit in, in order for it not to be too visually complicated. This is one that uses um, a, a very simple color palette. It's relaying the accurate information um, and it's appropriate amount of text. It's not a huge amount, but you can still decipher um, the content. And by the, the description of the header and the other um, elements of text elements and then the bottom uh, bar graph, then it's really clear what they're trying to communicate. So ineffective uh, map designs, one of them is when I talked about keeping it simple. This is when it's not keeping it simple. There's too much text you can't actually pick out. Um, you can't read the words individually because there's too many towns or rivers and things like that being um, labeled. And then the, the color doesn't seem to have a purpose. Uh, it, it, it may talk about type topography, so the elevation, but that's not actually very clear and that would be guessing at this point. Um, and it lacks that typographic consistency as well um, of how you're treating um, the, the names of the towns versus the, the, the countries and other towns. It just, it's just a little bit too, um, too random at this point. Though it's probably the same typeface, there's still too much variation. It's hard to figure out what's what. This would be a great example of having too much information 
you can't see anything because there's too much stuff. So you really need to simplify. And again, this one is just an ineffective objective. So they are using the primary colors, pink, yellow, and blue to try to effectively communicate something. However, everything kind of looks versions of purple in most areas. And so you can't really effectively communicate um, what they are trying to uh, what they're trying to do. So this is it's just a flawed plan, flawed design in trying to communicate that. Um, this one is incredibly interesting because you're like, well, it's trying to um, communicate different things, um, but it's doing has the same title, but it's trying to have different numbers and it's really hard to figure out what exactly it means. So that is one obviously um, from the history books that it really is ineffective. Um, and again, another confusing objective, what are they actually trying to communicate here? And why are they trying to use a map and color in this manner? They could have done it in another effective manner rather than um, doing it in this way so you have a lot of um, gradients. Um, it's just not a very effective way to communicate this topic.